good morning. In all my years of ministry, I've never made an announcement more important than what I'm about to share with you. All right? In all of my years of ministry, I've never made, I've, I've dreamt that one day I would be able to. But this morning, I have the privilege of telling you something that some of you are beginning to hear through different sources of media. And that is, God is sending revival across our nation right now, as we speak right now. Now, li listen to me. There's a, there's a lot of critics, and there's even critics in this room right now that say, Oh, that's not real. Well, time will tell. God does not need me and you to be revival police or investigators. But you dare not try to quench what God is doing. As the pastor of this church, I highly recommend that you tune in. I, I highly recommend, instead of you listening to what Brother so-and-so says, or Dr. so-and-so says, I highly recommend that you tune in and listen to what God's Spirit says to His church. And I pray that Leatherwood would be positioned to experience whatever God has for us. We will not try to mimic or manufacture we will not try to perform what revival looks like. But we will allow the atmosphere in our gatherings to bring together all the elements necessary for God to manifest His presence among us. Worship, love, the authoritative Word of God, prayer. Look. When all of these things come together and we, we take down our pride, we humble ourselves, we pray, look, we turn from our wicked ways, then all the elements come together and the Spirit of God moves as He is on campuses. And now I'm being told, in Times Square, New York, and then last night, I've not verified this, Ben, I keep picking on you, but every time I look up, I see you. I've not been able to verify this yet. I've asked Bob Thornton to track this down. In Israel, in Israel, revival sweeping through. Now, some of you are looking at me like, I don't even know what you're talking about, preacher. Well, I don't either except for what the book of Acts tells us about, where the Spirit moves in in such a way that everyone knows that it's God. We pray that that would happen even in this service right now. Would you join us as we pray? Father, send revival in this place remove us God some of us are very skeptical some of us are very judgmental about the things we don't understand but we humble ourselves right now and we ask you even now send a great revival in Jesus' name, amen.
from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Were creation suddenly articulated with a thousand tongues
give the Lord a hand this morning. Christ, be magnified in us this morning. We stand in your presence this morning. Give him all that we have. trying to tell you this morning throughout the week you're not worthy why do you go to that church why do you believe what you believe God don't love you there's no way God loves you enough to send his son to die for you those are lies lies of the enemy God loves you enough that he sent his son because he knew, he knew we weren't good enough. But what does, it, what does the Bible say? While we were yet sinners, not after we got saved, not after we got our lives cleaned up, that's not what it says. While we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. While we were sinners, he knew we were dirty. He knew we couldn't do it on our own. Why do we continually try? Don't believe the lie that the world is trying to tell you. That you're no good. You're not worthy. doesn't care what the world thinks about you. He's looking at you through his eyes. He created you. Not them. God created you in his image. He loves you. So we need to worship him this morning like we know that we know that we know that God loves us. And no matter what's going on in our life, whether it be sickness, family problems, whatever. He loves us enough to be right there with us through it all. That's how we need to worship this morning. If we think about that, if we think about that, God, if that's who we're worshiping this morning, there's no way in the world we can't stand praises to him and worship him. No way. Continue to worship with us this morning. Amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood Oh, heart in me, my soul undeserved. That's who we worship this morning. God, you're so
extinguish his followers? Make no mistake, to truly lead them, a loving God wouldn't allow mankind to suffer so much. What causes so many to believe in him? Foolishness. It is foolishness. Won't God continue to ignore the evil things men do? God can't hear us. You're wrong when you say God can. But I know we can fix things on our own. Don't be fooled into thinking God cares. Or maybe it's time to look at things another way. God cares. Don't be fooled into thinking we can fix things on our own, but I know God can. You're wrong when you say God can't hear us. The evil things men do continue to ignore. God won't. Foolishness? Is it foolishness to believe in him? What causes so many to suffer so much? Mankind wouldn't allow a loving God to truly lead them. Make no mistake. His followers will one day extinguish the fighting, the hate, the violence. Can't you see that we can hope in him? I refuse to believe that God doesn't care about people. No, the truth is, God cares for you. God does care for you in whatever situation you find yourself in this morning. God can turn it around. If you hear nothing else, hear that. Whatever situation you're in, no matter how hopeless you may feel, this morning, if you will yield, trust the Lord, He will turn your situation around. Let's not just share that opinion, but let's see what the Bible says about that. Turn with me to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, I'm going to ask you to remain seated, and we're going to walk through a few verses this morning, but let me set the table before I begin to read. Israel was in trouble. Israel was very vulnerable. All of us as individuals, all of us as churches, all of us as nations go through seasons when we're unstable. Again, some of you are there personally right now. When you're in one of those seasons as a church, as a state, as a nation, and you're vulnerable, you're unstable, here's what God warns us this morning. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you listen to. Again, let me repeat until I feel like you're with me. If you're here this morning, you're going through a difficult situation. If you're here this morning and you feel unstable spiritually, there's, there's high school students right now, and you're, you're beginning to transition into college or career. You're, you're beginning to make that transition. There's single men and women here right, here right now. You're beginning to make that transition into marriage and the possibility of marriage. There's some of you that are financially bankrupt and you're unstable right now. Beware. Beware who you surround yourself with. Beware who you listen to because it is during those times of instability that we are so vulnerable to listening to things that will ultimately destroy us. So is the case in Judges chapter 3. Israel was in a, in a season of instability. And listen to what the Bible says. Judges chapter 3 verse 5. The sons of Israel 
during this time of instability, y'all, the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. Here's what happened. Israel going through a season that we all do. Now God allows these seasons. God allows these trials. Because it's during these times of desperation that all of us have been through, or many of us are in right now, that we're tested to determine in whom we're going to in whom we're going to depend. And so, this was an opportunity for Israel to say, God, according to your promise, we are your chosen people and we are dependent upon you. But no, no. During these times, Israel, just like many of us, began to compromise. They began to compromise with one little compromise at first. And that was they compromised the residence that God had given them. Look, God had established them. God had chosen them. God had blessed them. But during this time of instability, they invited the world, so to speak, to reside with them. One, look guys, one little bitty compromise. From the compromise of residence, it led to the compromise of relationships. You don't hang around with the world without building relationships. That's why I'm so concerned about what's going on even among this flock, even among this congregation. You are the finest. You are the best of the best. I do love you dearly. But during the week, when you're not in this room, many of you are making little bitty compromises, little bitty things, and you're allowing, you're allowing the world to influence you. You stand in front of the mirror one day, and all of a sudden you realize something. Instead of looking like a set-apart, born-again believer, you look like, you talk like, and you live just like the world. That's exactly, exactly what Israel did. They compromised their residence. Then they began to reason in their common sense. They started compromising in their relationships. And then verse number 6 tells us their next compromise. And it was a very costly compromise for them. And it will be for us as well. They compromised their religion. Now if there's one phrase that I want you to take out of these doors when you go. This is the phrase. What they once abhorred. Does everybody in the room understand that word? What, what they once detested. What they once abhorred now became the norm. What they once hated, what once appalled them, now was the norm. I've entitled this morning's sermon, How Did We Get Here, America? How did we get here? And then the question is, can we get out? Well, stay with the sermon, and you're going to see. But let me give you a couple more examples. Now, now many of our big-time pastors are saying we need to abandon Genesis and what the Bible says about God creating the heavens and the earth. And, and they go on to say, hey, as far as that's concerned, let's just abandon the whole Old Testament. It really doesn't matter anyway. Let me tell you, it does matter. These things are written for an example to us. And just like Israel, compromise. No big deal. They had one compromise which led to two, and two led to three. One day the Bible says that Lot, a good man, pitched his tents 
near Sodom. That was innocent. He pitched his tents near pointing in the same direction. Not in it. Not, n- 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 he didn't plunge in. He made one, one little compromise. And then what does the Bible tell us about Lot? Soon he became a leader. And then soon after one little compromise, after another little compromise, he was then... How many of you men have daughters? Raise your hand. I don't have a daughter, but I can imagine. Then Lot was willing to pawn his daughters out. In other words, what he once abhorred, what he once hated, now became the norm. America, Leatherwood, how did we... How did we get here? The Bible tells us also about a man everybody in the room probably is familiar with. It was David's son. His name was Solomon. We know King Solomon because God made him the wisest man that ever lived. Many of the books that you hold in your hand in the holy inspired word of God, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Those books were written by the wisest man that ever lived. But everybody watch. One day, very innocent, one little compromise. Nothing big. One little compromise led to another. And he loved foreign women. He loved foreign women. Women, and the Bible says at the end of his life, he was a disgrace. At the end of his life, the wisest man that ever lived, First Kings chapter one verse, uh, chapter eleven verse six says this: He prostituted himself with the goddess of fertility, and he burned children alive on the altar of Molech. Everybody remember this when you walk out of this room. You don't have to remember a bunch of points. Remember this one phrase. Somewhere along the way, the abhorrent became the norm. Somewhere along the way for David. Somewhere along the way for Solomon. Somewhere along the way for Lot. That which they once hated became the norm. And they looked around, and they couldn't even tell the difference. Now, here's what ought to wake you up right now. Many of us know that we are living right now, today, today, in moral ruin. We had one of my heroes in our home for dinner Thursday night. In your home, by the way. I love that. We live in your home. And so, look, when we have people in our home, as we're going to do right after church tonight, we're having people in your home. And, and so if Suzanne cooks a bad meal, it's on you too, all right? Uh, but Thursday night, we had one of my heroes. He's not a great athlete. We had one of our heroes for dinner. He, he, he's not a celebrity As far as the world goes, it was Ken Welch, missionary to Africa for so many years. And oh, Ken, we were trying to watch the Wheel of Fortune. And if you've been watching the Wheel of Fortune lately, they they don't have couples like we used to know couples. This is my husband, and this is my husband, and we're husbands, all right? And Ken just looked up in a very calm and non-judgmental way. I know that ruffles some feathers when I mention mention issues like that, Toby. But old Ken, in a very calm way, said Sodom and Gomorrah had nothing on America. We're right where they were. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. What we once abhorred. What we once abhorred and drew back from and said, I cannot believe that's on national television, is now the norm. And we need to know where we're going. Judges chapter 3 verse 7 just begins to unveil very clearly 
where we can expect America to end up. Now, before I read, everybody look at me one more time because I forgot what I was saying. There's no doubt we're in moral ruin, but here's where some of us are going to wake up, all right? We're okay with the moral bankruptcy that we have. Here, here's what's going on, and I see it in our church people. Well, that's their business. What they do morally is their business. It's none of my business, and I think we need to stay out of everybody's personal business. And if I, if I were to say amen, some of you would accidentally say amen, but that's, that's how you really believe. Moral bankruptcy, moral ruin is becoming the norm. We're okay with that. But let me tell you, we're moral ruin. This is, we're at the very beginning of what I'm about to share with you. Moral ruin always leads to materialistic ruin. Now, we're okay with men and men marrying. We're okay with ladies, Romans chapter 1. We're okay with the moral ruin. But everybody look at me for just a minute. It's about to hit our pocketbooks. It's about to hit our billfolds. It's about to, it's about to hit that home that you are so proud of. It is about to hit us economically. And you say, Phil, how do you know that? Well, n number one, it's very obvious. I I've got some common horse sense, and I can see this, all right? But I don't care about my common sense. I want to know what the Bible says. And so all you have to do, being a preacher is easy. All you have to do is follow what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse number 7, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, put your finger right there for just a second. And so we think he's just going to give us a pass. We think that America is different. No, no, no. As it was for Lot, as it was for Solomon, as it was for Israel, you and I can know in, I believe, our lifetime. What's going to happen next? They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now here's some shocking words that we choose to ignore often. And he, the Lord, sold them into the hands of Cushan, king of Mesopotamia. And I can't pronounce, this is just his nickname, so I'm going to call him Cushan, all right? Cushan was his nickname. Cushan Rishaman, all right? Cushan was his nickname. His name meant this. Everybody look at me. Do you know what his nickname was? And he was given this nickname because of his reputation. He, his nickname was doubly wicked. That was his nickname. Cushan, king of Mesopotamia, his nickname was doubly wicked. Everybody draw near, huddle up, come real close for just a minute. Holy, holy, holy God loved Israel. He loves Israel today. And holy, holy, holy God watched Israel innocently make one little bitty compromise. And that one little bitty compromise led to two little bitty compromises. And before you know it, God's chosen people were worshiping foreign gods. And God's anger, God's wrath caused him to sell his chosen people to a man that was known as doubly wicked. And it broke the heart of God. America? 
how did we get here? Davis, as you grow, and, and many of our teenagers have been a part of a, an amazing movement this weekend called D-Now, and many of their hearts have been changed. Some gave their heart to Jesus, amen? And, and others of them who already knew Jesus, they're, they're, they're at a point of surrender. God, I'll do anything you want me to do. Now, Davis, what do you and all these young people that are watching this world it's normal to them. It's abnormal to those of us that are 50 and older. But what was once abhorrent to us is becoming normal. But here's what you need to know. Number one point is this. You must never compromise. As is in this text, don't compromise in your commitment to Him. Not even a little bit, Davis. N not even here and there. But, but, but here, here's where it gets difficult. Without the church, without godly parents, without Sunday school teachers, without mentors, Without me and you, Davis don't know what the biblical standard is. Why is Leatherwood so important? Why are we begging you to join? If not this church, go join another church. Because we know that if all you do is attend, you're never going to be a part of in investing your life. You're never going to be a part of raising God's standard. And so guess what's going to happen to Davis and all these other young people that our church is so blessed with? They're going to look at you and say, church membership must not be important. Marriage must not be important. And so what once was abhorrent because of a little compromise here and there becomes normal. And then God wakes us up. Then God wakes us up. And I, I cannot explain what Israel must have thought. How could God do this? How could he abandon us? How could he, according to scripture, sell us into the hands of Cushan, the king of Mesopotamia, known for being doubly wicked? Phil, what are you saying? Are you trying to scare me? No. Phil, are you begging me? You better believe I'm begging you. I'm begging this church, whoever's here today, whoever is watching online, I'm begging you to open your spiritual eyes. I'm begging you. Now, look, here's what happens. In good churches like this, we open our spiritual eyes and we start seeing what everybody's doing wrong. I'm not telling you to do that. There's enough judgmental people in this room to keep the world out of this church. And that is unacceptable. I'm not asking you to point out everybody who has sexual orientation problems. I'm not asking you to get a, a, a sign and start marching and showing how angry you are against what's going on in the world. I'm not asking you to do that. That won't work. You judging your children, you judging your cousin, you judging and pointing out what everybody's doing wrong will not, will not. It'll do more harm than good. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm calling you to do. 
I'm asking you right this second, not when the invitation starts, right this second, right there where you sit, every single person, please do this right now. Point out, let the Holy Spirit point out any area in your life that you're compromised. Let him do it right now. Let, we've made a big deal about the balloon, haven't we? China balloon, we've made a big deal, and we should have made a big deal about it. But listen, here, here's what China did, from what I know. I don't know much, but China, China compromised the United States of America. And we said, oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Maybe we ought to do something about it. But who knows the damage that happened by procrastinating doing what had to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, you're good people. You're the cream of the crop. You're the best of the best. And I'll say that with my hand on God's word, not trying to pump you up. I don't need a raise. I don't even need to be here next week. I need you to hear this. No matter how good you are, if you're beginning to compromise in one little area, you are headed for the same demise as Israel. Number two, not only do I want to tell you the bad news, I want to tell you the good news. And I may close with this if I feel like y'all are with me, all right? The good news is, if you have if you have, like Israel, opened up to the world, if you have, like Israel, not only opened your residence, your home, I don't want to take time, but talk about just what comes through your TV, all right? Talk about what comes through your computer. If you've opened up your residence through social media, if you've opened up your home, your life, your children's life, to, to the to the ways of the world, and you say, oh, hell, they got to learn. We can't, sh we can't shelter them. You've opened up your residence. If you're here this morning and you've opened up your relationships and you've started dating the world, you've started building relationships with the world. Hey, and that can be the oldest person in this room. All right, I'm not talking age. If you've started dabbling in the relationships of the world. Maybe even you're here this morning. And you're even questioning that there is a God. Maybe you come because you have to come. And you're even beginning to question all that you're hearing in the world today. Maybe God's not the only God. Maybe Jehovah's not. Maybe he's just a choice. And so one compromise leads to two compromises. And before you know it, you don't know what you believe. Everybody look, here's the good news. When you open your eyes and you realize that this is where you are, can we get out of it? Yes. Here's what the next few verses say. The Bible says to cry out to the Lord. Verse 9. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Hebrews speaks often. Romans speaks often. Romans 10 verse 13 says this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This morning if you feel like you're beginning a journey away from the Lord. This morning if you're where Israel was and you feel like God how are you doing this? God why are you doing this? God I, I just can't believe the situation that I'm in. The good news of the gospel is 
if you will humble yourself and pray. The good news of this Old Testament text is, if you will cry out to him, the good news is, he will send a deliverer. The Bible tells us in verse 9, again, listen. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. His name was Othniel. Now let me close by, let, let me go ahead and give you the third point. You, you got to trust in the sovereign Savior. You got to trust in the sovereign Savior. Now here's the beauty of preaching from the Old Testament. Th this Old Testament text is a beautiful example. It warns us, it gives us hope, and it shows us the deliverance of God. When the people cried out in verse number 9, what's this, sir? He will do it for you, ma'am. He will do it for you. God inclined his ear to him. One day David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. I cried out to him and he heard my cry. And he lifted me out of a horrible pit. God will do that if you'll cry out. Well, Israel, when they realized they had crossed the line, cried out to God. And God sent them a deliverer and his name was Othniel and Othniel led them now let me tell you about Othniel he was a judge that means he wrote the rules he interpreted the rules and he enforced the rules he was the man he was the man and many of us would love God to send somebody like that in our life Othniel was a strong leader Othniel laid it out there and delivered Israel out of the hand of old doubly wicked Cushan. But it all eyes on me right now, and you've got to hear this. That was the Old Testament. And many of us are waiting. Maybe Trump could be that man. Maybe our next pastor could be that man. Maybe God will send us somebody that will lead like Othniel. Now, now here's, what, here's a huge lesson. It's a nugget that many of us overlook. Othniel was used by God. He was the deliverer of Israel for this season. Everybody look at me. I'm going to get on my knees and beg you to hear me. Othniel was a man who died like all men. And he stayed dead. When Othniel died, Israel slumped back down into the same pit. Why? Because Trump can't do it. Phil can't do it. No man can do what I'm talking about. Can uh, I'm just going to keep using Trump because I'm already in trouble, all right? Uh, okay, okay. Can Trump help us financially? Probably. He probably can. I saw some of you shake your head, but he probably can. Can Trump help our gas prices come down? Probably. Can Trump help our retirement get better again? Probably. Trump's going to die. There's a 100% chance that Donald Trump will one day take his last... <gasps> breath and many of us are looking for a deliverer to save our material but America because of moral ruin mark it down write it in the leaf of your Bible you don't have to give me credit for this it's right out of the Bible we're headed for material Ruin everything that you have worked for all of your life is about to be sucked away. Sucked away. And I'll tell you how severe it's going to get. Are you ready? It's going to get so severe that for the first time, some of you are going to cry. Oh, we don't care about moral ruin. But you let it hit our economy. 
and it's going to get so bad. I don't know if China will get everything we've got or Russia, but I know this. Mark it down. It will get so bad that we will cry. America will cry. And do you know what God will do? Just like in this Old Testament story, He will send, He will reveal that He has already sent a deliverer. His name is Jesus. And He is alive. And He will never, never, never die again don't compromise if you have compromised cry out don't wait till you've got four or five divorces don't, don't wait until you bankrupt don't wait until you look at your family and say I caused this don't wait Cry out now. And then put all of your trust in a sovereign, proven Savior. Othniel died. Jesus will never die again. Let's pray. How did we get here? Let me ask you a very personal question. Very personal question. Can anybody look at your life right now and say, I can't believe I'm involved in this? Don't answer this out loud. And unless it's an emergency, please don't leave. Can anybody look at your life and say, I can't believe I've let myself Get in this mess. I can't believe I'm so deep in credit card debt that I can't even function. I can't believe I've got these relationships in my life that I know are pulling me down. And how familiar is this one? I can't believe that I'm an addict and that my body craves a substance that I know is killing me. Welcome to Leatherwood. You're sitting among men and women that know how you feel. And we've experienced something that we offer to you. The opportunity to cry out. There's no other way. Joining a church will not do it. Being baptized will not do it. But crying out. In repentance. Will do it every. Single time. Jesus. You are our deliverer. And I pray that you would set us free. One of the songs that we heard earlier this morning had one phrase. No, no chain cannot be broken. No chain cannot be broken. And this morning, if you feel like you've been chained down because of compromise, you're willing to take its responsibility. We encourage you to let the deliverer break that chain. Would you stand with me in Jesus' name? As this song is sung, Brother Scott will be here. The altar is open. God is speaking to your heart. You come right now. Cry out. Cry out. There's no other way. can't 
kneel, would you come stand? Everything we're longing for, the presence of the living God, breathe like only you can breathe. Will you humble yourself this morning? Come and fill this room, anything apart from you, let it anything to us. Every heart is open wide as your name is lifted high. Here, God, we know you're here. Moral ruin. Everything we're we longing for, the presence of the living God. Free, gone. that every person feels like they've had a true time of worship and examination by a holy God. Father, I pray that they would not leave thinking about the wrath of God. The wrath has been satisfied. Church, look at me. Church, look at me. There's so much of that sermon that needs to be preached. When you use Old Testament, you need 
two hours to do it. God is not angry with you. God is not waiting, guys. He's not waiting to crush you. His wrath has been satisfied. When Jesus died on the cross, all of the wrath of God was satisfied. He's not angry. He's not waiting for you just to cross that line and I'm going to get you. No. Old Testament, New Testament is. Even, and I'm pointing to Shane because he prayed this with his choir. Even in our sin. Even when we abhorred Him with our sin, Christ died. And when Christ died, He satisfied the wrath of God so that you and I don't have to be saved because we're scared. We have the opportunity to be saved because we're loved. And He will take the consequences of what sin does and he will give us abundant life so don't leave here saying I'm scared I'm about to mess up the last time hey you can destroy your life for sure you need to know Jesus loves you he is your deliverer he is the only deliverer and this church exists to help you come out of the muck and mire of the world thank you for being good listeners would you be seated while the ushers are coming